Welcome to the COVID-19 Physician Learning Series, brought to you by Juul and the Canadian Medical Association. I'm Dr. Gillian Horton. I'm a general internist, medical educator, writer, and podcaster, and I'm your host for this series. When it comes to health, physicians are often a primary source of information for patients. But we all know that the challenges inherent to practicing medicine can make it very difficult for us to maintain health-promoting behaviors in our own lives, and those challenges are about to get greater. It is therefore even more critical that we all work to adopt practices that are both realistic and high value for us during the months ahead. Joining me today is Dr. Mariam Hamidi, a member of Stanford Medicine's WellMD team, where she leads initiatives and conducts research into promoting well-being, self-management, and wellness. Mariam, thank you so much for taking the time to join me today. Thank you. It's a pleasure being here. Mariam, during the COVID-19 pandemic, many physicians are prioritizing frontline critical care over everything else in their lives. Can you start by telling us how nutrition has been shown to affect physician performance under real-life conditions? Sure. Uh, one of the biggest things that, you know, happens when we are really busy, we often stop attending to our own, you know, basic needs such as sleep um, and also nutrition, hydration. And we know that being dehydrated or even having mild um, um, hypohydration can result in deficits in our, in our attention, in our uh, reaction times, in our judgment. Uh, so, for example, pilots who are dehydrated make more mistakes uh, when they're landing or soccer referees. They make poor judgments when they're, where they're dehydrated. There are studies that have shown that for physicians, their short-term memory would be affected. So, it is important to keep hydrated. That's one of the simplest, easiest uh, things to do. And often it can be achieved by carrying a water bottle, if possible, and having sips of water uh, any chance you get. Um, to keep hydrated. Ideally, uh, we want to have a urine color that looks like lemonade, not apple juice. If it looks like apple juice, we need to to keep high, to increase our eye hydration and having more fluids. Um, the other thing is that would be helpful to keep in mind is that you know if you're a habitual uh, coffee or tea drinker, it doesn't necessarily result in um, dehydration. So that all counts towards fluid intake. Fruits and vegetables, if you get a chance to have them, are high in um, vitamins and minerals that are helpful um, in general for health, but also they have fluids and water in them that can be released over time, so they act like a time-released uh, fluid. In terms of how we could do that is, you know, carrying them in little Ziplocs, so things like, you know, grapes, cherry tomatoes, blueberries, uh, baby carrots, uh, things that are small and they can be eaten easily uh, or like uh, cut apples. If you don't have time for cutting things, then it will be things that are already small like grapes or berries. Um, and um, for, for other foods, things that, for example, we know having a diet that is high in added sugars and saturated fat can really impair mood uh, in particular over time, uh, but also can impair the quality of the sleep, which then it becomes a vicious cycle. Uh, we did an observational study with Sanford outpatient physicians, and we saw that the ones who had diets that were higher in uh, green leafy vegetables, vegetables and other vegetables, uh, berries, nuts, you know, legumes, and um, uh, were low in added sugars and saturated fat tend to have less sleep-related impairment during the day. So we also know that sleep deprivation can lead to us engaging in behaviors that are rewarding. Also, when we are feeling tired, we're more likely to crave uh, things that are higher in sugar and saturated fat. So uh, overall, a combination, it becomes like a vicious cycle that we feel tired, then we eat poorly, we eat poorly, it affects our sleep. So it, nutrition is one way to break that cycle. In terms of healthy things, I know that's a huge challenge to, um, to get access to healthy foods in, in COVID time. The good thing is that a lot of the um, uh, food organizations or food industry are supplying um, 
donations for healthy snacks and healthy drinks to frontline healthcare providers. So that's one way of, you know, reaching out to those organizations to ask for, for donations in particular during this time. So there are always healthy snacks available. Um, sometimes depending if the patient load in the hospital has become less because the elective surgeries, for example, have been canceled. The, the hospital kitchens may have more bandwidth to, to serve our frontline physicians and provide them with healthier meals, deliver meals to their workrooms. So, it, you know, we are all in this together and in any way that, uh, you know, we can support each other um, in, in, ta and in taking care of patients and ourselves, um, that's, that's all, you know, add um, to, to the whole effort. So some cities are in full-blown crisis right now, and there's no question there will be a tendency for physicians to work 24 or 36-hour awake shifts, just the way many of us did when we trained. Could you talk about research on how sleep affects performance and why we should question the wisdom of returning to those practices as opposed to using other schedule models? So in terms of sleep, we know that um, there are, again, earlier studies have shown that being sleep deprived is similar to, to being drunk. And the problem with that is uh, our attention comes and goes. So we have this micro lapses in attention. And at some point, people actually do fall asleep. I've heard from residents that they have woken up examining a patient and their head is on the belly of the patient because they were so tired, they didn't even realize they have fallen asleep. But before that, you know, there are these micro lapses in attention that we are not aware of. So, you know, and then we're all of a sudden we are alert again and we are more likely to make uh, mistakes and um, that can do more harm than good. Um, so any way that we can reduce that, uh, you know, extended shifts and allow people to have at least 12 hours of rest between one shift uh, until the other one would be quite helpful both mentally and physically uh, for people to, to have a, enough rest to be able to perform at their best. Um, and uh, again, that's, that seems to be very difficult, especially if there are not enough staff. So uh, working, uh, coming up with strategies where other, um, other staff or physicians can come and help. So for example, we hear that there are, for example, in ENT, um, Division, there are people who are board certified for internal medicine. So, you know, uh, using those resources so we have more people, uh, fellows. Um, so, basically, pulling in everybody so then we can give a break to those who are affected most so they can, they can just recuperate. And also, we know that sleep is huge in, in immunity. So, sleep deprivation um, uh, can, can decrease our immunity. And you know, there are studies that show that we do need at least seven hours, majority of people need at least seven hours of sleep for good immune health. And that's another factor that in this particular case is, is important to attend to. Perhaps the most important thing even before nutrition and hydration and anything else. You and I have spoken about this elsewhere, but could you review the strategic use and timing of both caffeine and green tea to ward off fatigue? Right. So that's, that's another, another strategy. So uh, use of caffeine can, can basically reduce um, um, uh, sleep, uh, drive for sleep, and also um, up to 36 hours. So beyond 36 hours, you know, no amount of caffeine can, can prevent uh, falling asleep. Uh, there are strategies in particular for caffeine that can be helpful. So one is like, you know, what dose is helpful? Some people are very sensitive to caffeine. So if all of a sudden they start having a lot of caffeine and they are also already, uh, so caffeine uh, enhances every mood that we are in. So if someone is feeling anxious or very tense or stressed, and all of a sudden they increase their caffeine intake, that increases that sense of anxiety. And that can be, um, that can make things more difficult. So knowing, you know, how to tighter our caffeine intake is important. Um, and uh, again, it will be similar to having like a bottle of water. Maybe if you don't mind your coffee being cold or buying cold brew coffee or, you know, um, um, 
if it's available at all times, having like little shots of espresso can help to kind of having smaller doses so that we don't cross that threshold of going to like full uh, anxiety, feeling heart palpitation. That's, that's one thing to keep in mind. Uh, caffeine can also increase our core body temperature. So if we are working during nighttime, it can increase the core body temperature and we are, we will be less likely to, to feel sleepy and tired. Um, there is also a time lag between the time that we have coffee for it to be effective. That can be from 30 minutes to 90 minutes, depending on, you know, our, uh, um, how much uh, we weigh, how, how, what food we've had before, kind of similar to, to alcohol. So um, uh, that can give a window of, so let's say if, if caffeine takes about 30 minutes to 90 minutes to be effective and you have a short opportunity to have to take a nap, then you can combine that together. So you can take a nap, you can have, your, have a, a cup of coffee, take a nap, and then by the time you wake up, then caffeine has kicked in and you've taken a nap. We know that when people are sleep deprived um, and if they take a nap, then sleep inertia or that grogginess after sleep becomes a lot more intense. So another advantage of having coffee before taking a nap is that it will reduce that sleep inertia. So if you have short periods of sleep, then, then as soon as you wake up, you want to have caffeine to get over that grogginess. At the same time, you know, if you are doing a 12 hour shift, you want to have caffeine ideally at the beginning of the shift and maybe in the middle of the shift and then try to uh, limit your caffeine intake about at least six hours prior to the time that you're planning to go to bed. And if for some reason your shift extends, then, then you can have another one. And the reason for that is caffeine can keep us alert for about three hours. And after that, it doesn't necessarily help with you know, our alertness or reducing our reaction times but it does impair our sleep. And the other thing with caffeine is it, it's been shown in a meta-analysis that it can reduce the risk of errors in, uh, in those who do shift work. So um, it, when um, sleeping is not a possibility, caffeine can be helpful. In terms of in what situation coffee is better than, um, than tea, um, caffeine is, like I said, it, it's, it enhances whatever mood we are in. So um, if, you know, feeling anxious or um, feeling jittery, then uh, um, uh, coffee may not be a good um, uh, option because it has a higher dose compared to tea, for example. The other one is coffee is good for, for things that require attention switching or if you're moving a lot, let's say for if you kind of think of an emergency medicine physician, coffee might be more helpful for them. Whereas green tea has something called L-theanine um, and uh, the amount of L-theanine in green tea is higher in particular in matcha tea compared to, to black tea. And L-theanine itself sometimes is used as something that's as a supplement to, to reduce stress or for relaxation. And the combination of L-theanine with caffeine in green tea, um, there are some studies that show that it enhances the, the effects of caffeine, so you need less of it, but also can provide um, a sense of concentration and focus. So if you need to do something that requires attention and, and detail, let's say in pathology, lab, then you might want to do green, um, green tea more than you would use coffee. Um, other um, options for caffeine would be, um, uh, you know, energy drinks or colas that have caffeine. Uh, they are not, uh, you know, again, depending, not everybody can take them. Uh, some of them have taurine. Taurine can really... Um, uh, crash, make us crash afterwards because it is it is helpful for for sleep as well as like um, to lesser degree alertness. So one suggestion is to avoid the energy drinks that are higher in in taurine. Um, and the other one, if people don't use caffeine, would be things like you know mint tea has been shown to have some some alerting effects through different pathways. Uh, rosemary, sage, these are elbow, elbow th things that can be helpful. Uh, rooibos tea tends to be a little high in iron. Iron has been shown to be effective with improving alertness. Um, yerba mate is another one that has caffeine. Um, so there are different different um, sources of caffeine and then there are caffeine chewing, caffeinated chewing gums that uh, some residents use and they find that to be also helpful if they don't want to have coffee or they have acid reflux, for example, that 
that can help in that instance. And a lot of times that's the combination of like the mint flavor and coffee. So, uh, I mean, and caffeine. Mariam, everyone is interested right now in how to boost their immunity. Are there any foods that you would urge physicians to prioritize in order to boost immune function? Any evidence that you could recommend? So in terms of um, evidence in general, it goes all back to healthy eating, having a diet that is high in um, fruits and vegetables, healthy protein, uh, healthy whole uh, grain carbohydrates, um, all of that, every single nutrient that, you know, the more nutrient dense our diets is, the healthier we would be. In terms of particular foods, uh, not really. And also, uh, you know, COVID is is a really new um, virus. We don't really know what it does and and what happens. But there are, um, uh, like in the news, you hear that, you know, vitamin C, intravenous vitamin C might be helpful. Taking vitamin C supplements might be helpful. Intravenous vitamin C is different. I leave that to, you know, our, our um, critical care uh, physicians and dietitians to to um, um, to decide on, but in terms of taking vitamin C supplements alone, um, one challenge of vitamin C is that high doses of vitamin C um, uh, can cause kidney stones. We know that uh, low doses of vitamin C doesn't really change um, immune function. It's usually higher doses of vitamin C that help with that. And a lot of times our healthcare professionals don't have enough fluids. So the combination of having high vitamin C and not having enough fluids can lead to kidney stones. So you don't want to show up in the emergency room at this time, you know, uh, because you were afraid of getting COVID or being infected by COVID um, um, virus and then also being um, having a kidney stone at the same time. So I would avoid large doses of vitamin C and try to get that from from. Um, food, um, in particular things like, you know, kiwi fruit, oranges, bell peppers, red bell peppers, uh, green bell peppers, broccoli, um, melons are high in vitamin C. Um, so that's one, one way of making sure that we do have enough vitamin C. Um, having enough uh, protein, sources of protein uh, can help with making sure that we, we do have, get enough zinc in our diet. Um, so that's again something that it is helpful for immunity and uh, zinc supplements. One one challenge is that sometimes some of the supplements that can be helpful for prevention of, for example, uh, cold or flu, are not helpful when the symptoms have started. So they can make things worse. So um, staying off uh, supplements as much as possible would be. Um, might be helpful unless it is advised by a healthcare professional to, to take supplements, specific supplements uh, for your particular situation. Um, otherwise, I would suggest having lots of green leafy vegetables. Um, if, if someone is not feeling well, then often having cooked foods are, are um, more helpful or avoiding things that irritate um, the throat um, if they have a cough could be helpful. Keeping hydrated is very important. Again, it goes back to all the basic things that we talk about nutrition, making sure that um, you're having enough water, having enough protein, having enough carbohydrates for the B vitamins, and also having uh, whole grains, that, that is, and also healthy protein. And as much as possible, avoiding added sugars and um, trans fat, saturated fat, that, and processed foods. Mariam, I have one final question for you today. Can you talk about some of the literature around how physicians can use chewing gum to manage stress? Will it work? Yes. So I actually, I remember I forgot to mention one of the strategies to, to keep awake and not make errors. Um, uh, some studies have shown that it is best to avoid food after midnight to 6 a.m. because when we eat when, uh, during times when we should be sleeping, we're more likely to make mistakes. Um, so in that situation, if we feel like, you know, uh, we need something, it can either be a small snack or sometimes chewing gum. So ch chewing gum can also be used at other times as well. So one benefit of chewing gum uh, that has been shown in some studies is that it can reduce stress or if we are feeling sleepy, it can help um, keeping us awake. And some, some mechanisms is like by increasing the blood flow to our brain or some other mechanisms that are um, still under investigation, but it's been shown to be 
helpful to have chewing gum. And another thing that might be helpful in that is that mint, we know that it does have an alerting effect, as I mentioned before. So that might be another, you know, a mint flavor chewing gum might be helpful for both coping with stress and also not feeling sleepy or if you're trying to avoid food at night um, and you still want to you know have you know chew something or have something that that can help you cope with the stress and the business. I want to end by saying thank you to you, Miriam, for taking the time to be with us today. You've given us so many practical, actionable tips that we can use to begin to address our performance via nutrition, hydration, and other mechanisms. Thank you. Glad to be here. I'm Dr. Jillian Horton, and thank you for joining us for this COVID-19 webinar series, Powered by Jewel. Take care of yourselves. Thank you for all that you do, and I'll see you again soon. Mm -hmm.